Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I'll just get started. So I don't know if you're not familiar with case text. I do have a couple of slides to just introduce us. I think they put the legal research companies right stacked in a row, which is good. Get the audience in a room and wear everybody out. Um, so uh, we, uh, our uh, CEO went through Y Combinator. He's an ex-litigator, uh, as are uh, a number of our other uh, members of the company, uh, including our general counsel. And uh, um, the kind of the inspiration for it was uh, the uh, dissatisfaction with the tools that were available, the fact that they were so horribly expensive and not actually that pleasant to use. Uh, so you're probably familiar with the market. Um, the goal here is to provide a better alternative. We believe we can do what West and Lexus do better, faster, cheaper. So um, I'm not sure how, uh, you know, many in the audience are technical versus lawyers, but the, uh, the most important thing when you're arguing a case is that you can find relevant precedent and that you can um, explain why your argument built on previous cases is going to uh, prevail in court over the other guys. And uh, so, you know, one thing where technology becomes extremely critical, as time goes on, you have more precedent, you have more law, there's more you'd have to wade through and read through. So without technology, it would just be more time reading through books in a library, which um, is on its face fun, but if you've ever tried to read a judicial opinion, it's actually not. Um, at any rate, um, we have, uh, the first thing I want to do is give you an overview on our actual architecture at Case Text. Um, so we uh, have kind of evolved quite a bit. Uh, when the site started out in the Y Combinator days, we were just a Django site. Uh, we built a batch processing system about two years ago that used a technology called HTTP forwarding that is not used anywhere else in the universe. And uh, it had its advantages. It was simple. It was easy to build. Every library in every uh, language, or every language in the world has a library to support it. That was part of the appeal, was that you know, if you wanted to write something in C++ or Go or whatever, you could sit down and put a little piece of code in for it. Of course, there's plenty of other companies trying to build pipeline technology, and we're not an infrastructure company. So uh, in the past year, I have moved everything over to uh, Spark and DMR. Uh, we do not have any ops people in the company, which means that I get to wear an ops hat uh, when we need to build stuff. So my goal with everything has been to uh, minimize the amount of uh, uh, actual like maintenance and babysitting that it all requires. Uh, EMR is fantastic because I don't have to be a Hadoop administrator. Every, you know, when I was learning Spark, the one thing I learned talking to everyone who used it was the people who really liked Hadoop all had big companies with DevOps teams where the people who actually liked Hadoop never actually had to worry about installing it or configuring it or setting it up. And I, thankfully, Amazon does the hard work for us. Um, one of the most important pieces at the beginning of this hopper is XML transformation. It's also the least glamorous, but we pull in uh, vendor-sourced uh, XML files for the judicial opinions. Uh, most statutes and regulations we're able to get actually directly from uh, the government. There's a uh, gentleman by the name of Arya Hershowitz who works with uh, the Library of Congress to produce a very, very high quality XML version of the US code, which we use on our site. Um, and uh, the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, is not quite as nice. They have uh, um, printer typesetting codes in the XML, and that's uh, quite a bit more work to get. But at any rate, so we have a bunch of data munging that transforms all of these XML files into a common format. Um, and uh, that gives us one single format that all of our other code has to work with. So the fun stuff, the NLP analysis. Uh, Apache Wima is a library that was originally put together for uh, the Watson Jeopardy project. It since has found adoption all around the world thanks to being an Apache project. And of course, as things go in big companies, there is now a faction inside IBM that is trying to replace it with an alternative technology because that's what happens when you have as many people in your company as a small country. Um, I uh, spent a number of years at IBM, and uh, actually, the, uh, I was introduced to Wima working uh, on analyzing medical literature at the Almaden Lab in South San Jose. And then when I went to Case Text, I thought, you know, this is a useful tool for the law as well. Um, at any rate, what's really cool about it is that you get this index that you can navigate for all the different entities you find. So it doesn't actually give you any particular facility for identifying stuff, but what it gives you is a great tool for actually manipulating the different things together. So we use a variety of uh, techniques for actually finding things like citations and case titles inside of the text. Now a title is a difficult thing because um, it's 
there's a lot of ambiguity in has the title in it or not. It takes traditional NER problems and kind of turns them up a notch because you are trying to find a juxtaposition of entities and you're trying to find where their actual description as a joint entity ends versus being discussed in reference to some other entity. And so the fact that you're looking for a concatenation of entities is tricky. Thankfully, uh, most case titles, I think something like 98% of all case titles have a V in the middle, uh, a coordinating conjunction to use the uh, um, part of speech raising from uh, the Stanford tagger. Um, and so that actually makes it quite a bit easier to find, but the point is that if you are able to find sort of ancillary information, you can improve your odds of actually getting a match dramatically. So you want to find a docket number, you want to find a date of the decision. Now you have a title, a docket, a, a, a date, and a jurisdiction, you have a chance of correctly identifying the title of the case. Otherwise, you know, there are many John V. Doe. In fact, there are, I think, something in the neighborhood of 500 cases that are, um, I think some particular insurance company versus state. There's, there, we have some very litigious insurance companies and uh, they have sued the government many, many times. Um, so this is kind of pipeline overload. We have, uh, you know, WEMA pipelines running inside of Spark pipelines, all manipulated by uh, airflow, which is more pipelines, but that seems to be the way things go these days. Um, the architecture is, you know, simple in broad strokes. Uh, data lives in S3, except when it is relational, and then it lives in Postgres. Uh, the goal is to minimize the amount of data that actually has to live in the relational database. But case law it does have relational aspects to it, so it is nice to be able to do that. Postgres is a fantastic tool, and um, what goes in there is really only a couple of gigabytes of metadata. All the real stuff lives in S3, and the goal with the construction of this system has been to make sure that very few operations ever have to actually touch Postgres. Um, it's kind of used as a kind of a baseline of storing that these XML files are all actually different copies of the same case and giving us some ability to say, well, let's prefer the one that's published, the one that's from the better vendor, the one that we didn't scrape from the court itself. Um, for a while, when we first started out, I actually wrote a little thing that took the PDF files from the Federal Circuit every morning. Um, just stripped out the text and used a bunch of regular expressions on the white space to get decent HTML out of it. This is because we were trying to uh, uh, convince uh, patent litigators that we were a, a relevant alternative to uh, West and Lexis. This was you know, in the very early days when we didn't even have state courts online. So it was any niche that we could get easily and in a timely manner. Um, one thing that's great about working with law is that it actually is very deterministic. Um, most English text, as you know, is not something you can analyze with a you know, context-free grammar. But the law actually is. This is why reading the opinions is not the most you know, joyous thing in the world. But um, it all is very, very formulaic. The blue book is the style guide used by lawyers. And it specifies in great detail what everything has to look like. And the great thing about that is it's an opportunity to find lots of low-hanging fruit before you start delving into the ML technologies. And What's great about that is when you have found tons and tons of stuff with really high confidence using deterministic methods, you have an enormous amount of kind of scaffolding to build an ML approach on. You know where the citations are. You know what the citation graph looks like. You know where your jurisdictions are. So in terms of figuring out how the cases relate to each other, you're already miles ahead than if you were just trying to use it based upon word to vec or word soup or any other type of more general technique. Um, so these, uh, anyway, this, so these summaries, the parenthetical summaries are uh, when one judge uh, quotes another, uh, or cites another case and actually, let's see if I can find an example of one right now. So here is Brown v. Board of Education on our website. And let's go to this in here. All right. I can do this without, ah, all right, try this again. Okay, so you see at the very top, we see a few of these summaries that we've harvested from other cases. And these are really, they're fantastic. Uh, they um, really do summarize what we understand Brown v. Board to be about. And if we click on one of these links, we can go and see where it is in context. So you see, you know, here's one of them. It's not the Brown v. Board one, but uh, yeah. So here we can see 
no, this is a completely different one. Well, this is, yeah. But at any rate, you see an example of them in context. And so you see the citation, then you see the parenthetical, and the judge does very succinctly summarize what the case that is being cited is about. So in terms of presenting context to our users and presenting context to lawyers, this actually is fantastic for at the very top of the case being able to say, this case you're about to read, this is what it's about. Westlaw has headnotes and um, the problem with headnotes is they are often not written by experienced lawyers, they are written by people who just got out of law school and frequently are people who just got out of law school and are working for West because they couldn't get a job as a litigator. Um, the belief here is that judges are going to do a better job summarizing cases. But you know, so how to harvest them? The um, one of our uh, one of my colleagues at Case Text, a guy named Pablo Arredondo, is an ex litigator, and he uh, is the guy who came up with the idea for this technique. He put together a uh, regular expression for finding them, and um, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it, it did the job for a proof of concept. Uh, we had an earlier iteration of the site that had a bunch of these stuck in the margin from uh, this particular technique. Uh, we have since put together a more refined approach. Um, we use a context-free grammar to identify all matching sets of parentheses in the text. Uh, after that, we associate them with citations and see if the contents of the parenthetical match our understanding of what a judicial summary or a, uh, what in these summaries actually looks like. Um, there's a few words that always start off the most significant ones. If it begins with holding, there's a really good chance that it's something you're going to want to read. Um, we actually sort them based upon the uh, present participle in terms of which ones we think are the most interesting. Uh, it's a little bit capricious, but I think it actually works quite well. Um, the other technology we've put together on this is a thing we call key passages. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that the most quoted sections of the text are going to be likely to be the ones that you actually are most likely to want to read. Um, the, uh, and what we find is that people don't quote necessarily the same five or six words, but they will quote pieces of the same paragraph. And so what we do is we find all of these inbound quotations and we kind of anneal them together. And the end result is these are the paragraphs that are the most significant in this particular case. Um, and a s example of that, um, go back to, oh, nope. So for that, you get some really fantastic words from Warren. He was a guy who really could write, and uh, some of his best writing shows up at the top. These are the pieces of Brown v. Board that people quote, and they really are some fantastic sections. But you know, they really also sum up um, the most important aspects of the case in you know, much more detailed language than they get in the summaries. So now in these two things at the top of the page, you already have kind of the most important pieces for understanding this case. You might have to read the entire opinion if you are trying to dig a little deeper, or more importantly, if it's a more obscure case that hasn't been quoted as much as this one. But if you're looking at a landmark opinion, you are gonna get right here everything you might see in a textbook if you were a law student describing the significance of this case. Um, which, if you are trying to kind of whittle down which pieces of, of, uh, which pieces of opinion you need to present your brief, it's a very valuable tool. So that is, yeah, I, mean, I think I explained that. Uh, as far as the actual numbers, uh, the first time we ran it, I haven't actually updated these since we've kind of tweaked some bugs in it, but the first time we ran it, we came up with uh, um, what, so two and a half million uh, uh, summaries over the course of eight million cases, and uh, it, uh, about one and a half million actually got summarized which is a pretty good ratio, um, considering that the graph of citation is kind of a you know, big mountain that tails off with a really long tail. The most heavily cited cases are procedural things, things like Anderson Liberty Lobby that's been cited 150,000 times. Uh, most cases have been cited three or four times. Often it's not a significant citation in terms of understanding it. It's more a significant citation in terms of understanding where it went, such as, say, there are, if you look at the body of the Supreme Court, uh, output of it over the last 100 years, I think something like 80% of all opinions that, that they've handed down are just simple certiori denied, certiori denied. The, you know, it's a relative minority of them where they actually heard a case and made an opinion. 
that's still significant. That's the kind of thing you still want to be able to present to the user because it says that the, you know, the circuit court was final. But uh, it, uh, it does say that if you have this much spread around, we actually have done a pretty good job of being able to summarize this stuff without having to use machine uh, summarization techniques, which I've gotten a lot better. And they at least are usually factually accurate, but they're not really fun to read. Uh, so a little bit of a demo. This is a uh, word cloud that uh, Pablo mentioned earlier, created using the uh, present participles in all of the found summaries. And you can see holding and finding really do stand out with the lion's share. So drag this guy over here. Oh, no. Maximize. Make the text a little bigger. So I've loaded into the Scala REPL um, a uh, few of our libraries. So um, one thing you can see, we have this judicial summaries pipeline that chains together all the annotators. And if we were to run it, so I've fed into it the case that had the very top summary on Brown v. Board. So I'll open that case over here, and you can see it. And so let's find. So here is the little summary that we're actually going and looking for. And so you can see we have the citation, and you can see it's been recognized because the citation has been hyperlinked at this point. Uh, you have all three parallel sites. Um, if we go over here again, and we run this, it will sit here and chop up the case and what you see is all of the debugging output from the grammars that is saying that, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, it's fine. And now we can print all the summaries. And so these are the kind of the structures of these Weem annotations. Uh, you have kind of the begin and the end inside of the text, and then you have the little pieces of information that we've annotated onto them. So for this judicial summary, uh, you can see the citation that it was associated with, and uh, that's kind of how these all get pulled together. Uh, but it's great because you can see if one annotation covers another or how else they're related to each other. Um, let's see, other thing I was going to. Right. But that's more or less, uh, yeah, the substance of it. So I'll take any questions. How big is the data set? Uh, there are about 8 million opinions in uh, overall courts, well, overall courts that we have in our database. There are a lot of really minor trial courts and traffic courts that we have not got the opinions of. Uh, Westlaw would have them because they really do try to be a complete representation of all the law. At some point we may try and get that, but it's a laborious and expensive to get a lot of that data, and it's stuff that most users don't actually care about. So it's the kind of thing where we're adding kind of more of the long tail, more obscure stuff as we grow. But there's eight million that cover, I think, like federal district courts, most state courts from um, like the top three tiers of most state courts. Uh, total, in terms of bytes, how many parallel bytes less? Say, if I stripped all the markup off of it, I think probably no more than a terabyte of just actual text. Um, we have considerably more in S3 just because we have different representations. Every time you transform it, we stash the artifact and put kind of the fields of the relational database in the S3 key so that there's no need to do a lookup. We immediately can just infer what the thing was about. Have you worked with um uh, abstractive summarization at all, or just just extractive? Like, I mean, I, I know that there's the human created and curated um, sort of head notes that are written by the case text community. But have you tried generating stuff that's more on the abstractive side? We've not. Uh, the question was, have we tried generating abstractive summaries instead of just extractive? And we have not gone that road. The assumption was this was really easy to get at, and it was going to be of a higher quality than our first few passes of abstractive might have been. But there are a lot of cases that we will probably have to try techniques like that on, um, just because there is limitation to what you're going to get in a crowdsource model. So, uh, how do you guys uh, extract uh, key passages 
from the example you have shown, uh, that uh, you're showing the text inside the code. So is that what you extract, or do you do any sophisticated uh, process around that? Oh, um, so that is, I will show you actually an artifact that we get out of that. Is, may as well maximize this at this point. So that I can so if we take this, if I click on this passage here, um, what it will show is every time somebody quoted uh, a piece of this passage. And so now um, we have 51 times when this particular passage was quoted. And I think I just made it go away. Uh, the funny thing is you work on uh, you know, the batch processing operation at a company, you find you don't actually use the website that often. And then you go to demo it and you realize you don't actually know how it works. <laughs> But um, at any rate, this is, uh, so you see here, we have all 51 cases that uh, quoted this passion. So you can see the different subsets that they take. Um, and the, uh, you know, if I click on this, then I can pull up in context where this was quoted. And uh, I think it's been a while since I restarted my browser because uh, it's, what it's supposed to do is have a little bit more highlighting going on here. But sometimes if you, you know, don't restart your browser for a month, it stops behaving correctly. <laughs> Spark is actually what does like kind of the running of the analysis. So it uh, just takes, so it's getting this kind of thing is a two pass process. You first find all outgoing edges on every case and you stash that information somewhere. Um, Part of it goes into the XML so that we can read hyperlinks and other things like that. Some of it goes into uh, Postgres so that we have an edge graph. Um, and then we do an inbound edge process where we take all the cases and run them through and say, okay, who, who cited this case and how did they cite it? Did they quote it? Did they summarize it? And we pull all of that data together at once and kind of generate all of the pieces of the website. Uh, there actually isn't really a traditional backend on the website. Everything is, uh, there's a, I don't know if you're familiar with Firebase. It's a platform as a service over top of MongoDB. Google bought them uh, a year or two ago. Um, that's just used for kind of the mutable user involved data. But everything here is actually put in S3. Um, and so it all just kind of gets loaded single page uh, Angular JS app. Anything else? Put this back here. Or